Dr. Shah, let's get right into it. The Rockefeller Foundation is one of the largest private foundations in the world with over $4 billion, projects in dozens of countries and offices on four continents. And you've made supporting children and schools here in America a major priority during the pandemic. What drove that decision? And what have been some of the key initiatives that you've launched to help? Uh, well, uh, thanks for asking. You know, the Rockefeller Foundation has been working on hunger for more than 100 years. So it was an easy decision because, you know, during the peak of this crisis, 14 million children in America were regularly missing meals, uh, three times more than during the Great Recession, and five times more than before the pandemic. And given that, we just felt we had to do everything we could to try to uh, make sure that every child in this country, one of the wealthiest and most prosperous countries in the history of humanity, had the opportunity to be fully nourished. And so we partnered with school districts, we partnered with uh, child hunger organizations, we partnered with Feeding America, and so many others, including the US Department of Agriculture, to make sure that you know as many kids as possible even during a disrupted school lunch cycle, were able to access uh, food and were able to also help access food on behalf of their families. So what were some of those initiatives? How did, what did they look like on the ground? Well, you know, just I'll give you one example. Uh, we worked with the National School Lunch Program uh, to help make sure that schools could be uh, points of food service delivery, even when they were not open. It's often uh, not as appreciated in this country that 30 million kids rely on school meals to get the food that they need. Many of their families rely on uh, take-home packages of food from schools to be able to meet their needs for food and nutrition. So the reality is when that gets disrupted, a major part of the American social safety net, making sure people don't go hungry, gets disrupted. So we partnered with uh, nonprofit organizations across the country to make sure that kitchens could be converted into uh, places that prepared meals for uh, at-home delivery or pickup. We worked with all kinds of policy uh, makers and policy institutions to make sure that some of the changes and adaptations were made in school lunch programs and, and rules and requirements so that the program could reach as many people as possible. Uh, during a period of time when schools themselves were were less effective for accessing uh, food and nutrition. Now, earlier in your career, you actually served as the chief scientist at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which, of course, has a major role in setting policy for childhood nutrition and standards, as well as directing school feeding programs. So you have a unique perspective here. In your view, what steps should be taken to strengthen those critical programs and also better feed American children? Well, you know, I think first we have to just recognize how America today tries to provide nutrition support to those who are vulnerable. Uh, the reality is the Department of Agriculture is the largest food service program in the country uh, and supports efforts to fight hunger in a tremendous and sort of at scale manner. Uh, and so that needs to be funded, that needs to be modernized, and that needs to be made more accessible, particularly for low income communities and minority communities. Black and brown communities have been twice as likely to go hungry during this crisis than everybody else. I'd say second, there has to be a, a, a genuine rethinking of the role of food and nutrition in uh, American health. The reality is often these programs have been sort of commodity programs that are about making sure that farmers and producers have customers in, in years where they have excess product. That's been true since the 1950s. The reality is while that made sense back then, it does not make sense today. And the result is we put way too much, uh, often you know, cheap and unhealthy food products and agricultural items into the food programs that are about supporting low-income communities and children. And that's just not right. We should be much more focused on uh, linking these programs to the modern science of nutrition. It's not just any food. It needs to be healthy food. And we know that healthy food is actually the number one uh, solution to reducing the future burden of disease for cardiovascular disease, for diabetes, for hypertension, 
you know, three of the major causes of mortality and morbidity in this nation. And we also know that those diseases disproportionately affect minority communities and lower income communities. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has supported prescription food programs with insurers and nonprofits. Where we've done that, we've seen that if you actually give people a, a strict, healthy diet, uh, they do much, much better. Their hemoglobin A1C levels come down considerably and they're able to be, uh, you know, uh, they're able to avoid long-term chronic diseases like diabetes. We need a rethink of what food is for in this country. It's not just calories, it's about health and our, our food service programs and hunger programs need to account for that. Absolutely. And as a type one diabetic myself, it pains me to see, you know, what some of these children are, are eating and how we are sort of setting them up for a very tough road ahead. Like me, you are the proud child of immigrant parents. What do you see in other countries that perhaps the U.S. can adopt in its child nutrition programs? Is it what you talked about in terms of healthier food, or are there other things that the U.S. can learn from other countries that are doing this better? Well, when, when we look around the world at food service programs and child hunger programs, we see uh, a few things that actually are instructive for the United States. The first, as you point out, is, is really, you know, in some cases, a focus on health that is, that's stronger than what we see in the U.S., you know, whether it's in certain parts of India or certain parts of Africa, where I've had a chance to work for, for several decades, I've actually been in uh, schools where you know, all the kids are deeply malnourished, where the entire community is suffering from regular hunger, a hungry season that, that lasts for two or three months every year after uh, the harvest runs out. And in that setting, it's just so painfully obvious that a school feeding program needs to actually be nutrition focused for kids to survive and have any chance. And so they do put a little more effort, it seems, in making sure that, that those meals have the right micronutrient mix to support kids who might have certain micronutrient deficiencies. Understanding that this is one of the few places where kids get protein and providing, you know, the right kind of protein in that setting. And frankly, taking food home from those settings to their families, uh, both to make school a more attractive destination for kids, especially girls, and to make sure that nutrition is, uh, that kids are kind of teaching families about nutrition uh, much more broadly uh, than simply feeding hungry kids in a school or in a classroom. Uh, those things are starting to permeate parts of the American food safety net. Uh, but frankly, too much of our food safety net is, is uh, cheap, processed, unhealthy food uh, that we can either buy cheaply or prevent from uh, wastage or spoilage. And, and we're dumping too much of that type of food into the food safety programs in the U.S. I think we can do better. And frankly, around the world people can do better to understand that children are not just uh, a community of kids that, you know, you can prevent from being acutely hungry, but they're our future and, and they can be uh, well-nourished. They'll learn better. Their, their nutritional habits will rub off on their families. And long-term, those communities will have better health outcomes and lower long-term healthcare costs. So we need to think of this in a much more strategic manner and learn from examples around the world. And in terms of uh, the U.S. reaction to child hunger, especially as it is elevated in many minds, in many hearts and minds in America because of the pandemic and the images that we're seeing on television screens across the country of food lines, this is a moment in time when people are actually speaking out and becoming more and more aware of this pandemic that is one, it's this epidemic that has been going on for quite some time. Um, when you see the awful stories of statistics on child hunger, because you are so familiar with them and you look at the statistics around food insecurity, you know, how does being a physician and a father give you a unique perspective on hunger and how does it make you feel as a father and as a physician? Well, at the end of the day, you know, when I see hunger in a child here in the United States or anywhere around the world, I ask myself, uh, you know, why, why does this still exist? It's just so archaic 
for children to go hungry, for children in developing countries where Rockefeller works extensively, you know, to be starving. Uh, and for children here in the United States, one of the wealthiest countries ever, uh, with you know so much food production capacity that we we feed uh, many parts of the planet in addition to our own uh, home country, that that children live in food deserts, don't have access to safe and healthy food on a regular basis, and ultimately, especially during times of crisis like this pandemic, just go hungry. I've been so proud that organizations like the Urban School Food Alliance, Gen Youth, uh, the World Central Kitchen, these are our partners, and some of them do a really good job of trying to make it visible to the rest of society that, hey, the folks who you know are working on farms, preparing uh, your food at the beginning of the food supply chain, or the... Uh, People that are working in uh, restaurants or in food service and food delivery, they are the ones most likely to experience hunger at home. And their children are the most likely to experience hunger at home. I think we need more people to realize that, to, to sort of not just celebrate essential workers because they have helped our nation get through this crisis, but to recognize that America has become a place that's not very fair to those essential workers. You know, someone out there uh, delivering food on DoorDash or working at a food service uh, restaurant during this crisis, they shouldn't have to worry that their kids are going to go hungry or that, their or that there might not be enough food at the end of the day for everyone in the family to be nourished. That's just wrong. And that is something we can absolutely solve with, you know, a little bit of tweaking and investment uh, around our public policy and with the renewed American consciousness that the kind of hunger we've seen during the peak of this crisis, you know, last summer and this fall, we should never experience that again in this country. We should make that vow to each other and stay committed to make sure it, it holds true. You talked about awareness and commitment, but there are people who are tuning in today who want to go further and make an impact. What steps do you think they can take to make that difference beyond being aware and making a commitment in their own lives to, to tweak things and perhaps just be more present in those situations and mindful of people's specific needs? What, what, can, what actions can our viewers take today? Well, I'd say every community in America has a network of organizations that work on food and hunger locally. And so, you know, it could be uh, DC Greens in Washington, DC, or Martha's Table in Washington, DC. It could be the Urban School Food Alliance in a community near you. Wherever you are, I would look out for those types of organizations and make a donation, get on their lists, learn about what they're doing with their work, read their emails as they send updates. It'll, in addition to providing critical resources, it'll just get you in the flow of being part of the solution so that no American child goes hungry in a future crisis. Second, I actually do think it is important to use your voice. And when I say tweaks to the system, I don't mean you know small adjustments. I, I, what I mean is we just have to, as a nation, stand up and say we expect our political leaders to ensure we live in a country that, where children don't go hungry. That's achievable. More investment in the school nutrition programs is achievable. Improved actual nutrition in the packages of food that are sent to families and kids is achievable. And we should all be using our voice. We should all be trying to vote for candidates who stand up and fight for those issues. And we should recognize that there's no kid in this country who's quote unquote done something wrong and therefore they deserve to be hungry. That's crazy. Uh, we should just be able to say that as a great nation, Every single child is going to survive, is going to thrive, is going to have the nutrition they need to learn and, and aspire to a better future and, and make that an absolute reality. And the final thing I do think is personal. It's, it's you know, in your family, in your community, uh, for each of us as individuals to better recognize the link between the food we consume and our long-term health and get educated on nutrition. I've had to do that myself. <laughs> we struggle with that every day in our own family, but America's had a food culture that, that's been uh, one that has been very defined by uh, low cost foods with high added fats, added sugars, and added salts. And that means uh, we have the highest rates of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and hypertension, especially amongst lower income communities of any country in the world. 
uh, that's not sustainable. And that's all about the food we eat and the food system that we uh, enable. And we need to deal with that as consumers. As I'm going to put my journalist hat on for a second, but that has long been a problem in American society and part of almost, you know, eating, eating in a way that putting cost before nutrition has sort of been woven into the American way of life. Do you think we can unravel that and get people to perhaps invest more in food because it is healthier and that includes the government? Is that possible? Yeah, I, I do. I think, I think we absolutely have to. I mean, you're, you're hundred percent right. If you look at uh, the food system and the food we consume as a percentage of GDP uh, uh, until a few years ago, it was sort of eight or 9%, I believe in the United States, twice that in Europe and, and maybe three or four times that in many other countries in, in emerging environments around the world. Now you don't want that number to be 60, 70, 80%. That means your economy is just struggling to feed everybody and produce enough food to do so. Um, or acquire enough food to do but so. It should be higher. It should be, but higher. it should be higher than single digits. Absolutely, and we should recognize if that number also reflects, you know, health and the long-term consequences to our uh, individual and community health, and if it represents resilience to crisis, uh, we should be willing to pay more for more local food, for more resilient supply chains, uh, for food produced in places where uh, meat packers have you know, actual real incomes and, and safety uh, in the workplace and appropriate uh, benefits. And across the board, farm, farm workers and food service workers are treated fairly. That's worth paying for, um, not just in our individual health outcomes, but just as a nation. And that's something we got to get comfortable with. I love that message. Spend more on food. That's something that we have to get more comfortable with. Dr. Shah, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you and the Rockefeller Foundation for everything that you do. We really appreciate it. Thank you.